Hi, my name is Wendy Myers. I'm a health and nutrition coach in Los Angeles, California. And today I'm so excited to have you on my Live to 110 Health Transformation webinar. Um, I started live to 110com because I am really passionate about health and nutrition. And I wanted to teach you all about nutrition, how to lose weight, how to detox safely from all the heavy metals and industrial chemicals that are so prevalent in our environment today. And my goal is to help you live to 110. So let's get started with our webinar. And just give me one second. I just have to bring up the PowerPoint presentation that's going to go along with my little spiel that I have set out for you today. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. And let's get the presentation up. And today we are going to talk about all kinds of things. We are going to talk about uh, why nutrition is so confusing. This is a big, big topic. It's uh, amazing how many different theories there are about nutrition. We want to talk about the best diet, uh, all about vegetables and the importance of water. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what you want from your life. And then we'll talk about a couple goals uh, that I want you to do for next session. So why is nutrition so confusing? Um, one of the reasons is that we're all different. Uh, many people dramatically improve their health by adopting a paleo type diet. Um, paleo is like, you know, eating like a caveman, how the cavemen ate in the paleolithic era. Some can go without animal protein, uh, the vegans. Um, there are people who feel best eating 70, 80% of their diet from fat. Some eat low carb, others eat high carb, others eat anything all day long. And I think these people are universally despised, but in terms of everything works, you know, and there are people getting incredible result of results with each of the above eating styles. And why is this? You know, it's because we're all different. We have different metabolisms, different body types, different genetic predispositions, and different responses to foods. We have different ethnic backgrounds. Um, these are why these wide differences account for so many different diets that work for different people. But beyond some basic fundamentals, um, you know, I think the more or less everyone can agree on that, you know, eating whole foods or that vegetables are good. Um, but blindly following some nutrition plan, especially of the more extreme variety without listening to your own body and paying attention to how you feel will likely lead to poor health. You want to avoid any diet that is all raw food or high protein or high anything. You know, our bodies need balance and variety. So extreme, extreme diets do not support health in the long term, though they may be okay for a period of a few weeks. So if you feel awful on a given diet, don't give up so soon. Um, there are some exceptions where you'll be, you'll be feeling bad on some diets initially. For instance, uh, excluding gluten will make you feel you know, kind of crappy for a bit due to withdrawals from the heroin-like effects on the brain. But some people feel better initially on a vegetarian or vegan diet, but that's only because their digestion um, could be screwed up and they don't produce enough stomach acid to digest animal protein. So it just kind of sits like a rock in their stomach and doesn't make them feel good. But however, in the end, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work. So forget the dogma and the nutrition tribalism and move on. Another reason nutrition is so confusing is because books are very convincing. You know, any book can make a convincing argument for their case with research to back it up. You know, the nature of writing is to convince readers of your viewpoint. Pretty much every book I've read on nutrition has swayed my convictions by the end of the book. You know, after reading the Atkins diet, I ate 25 grams of carbs a day and began eating processed low carb bars and pepperoni sticks. And it was nasty, but the book said to do that. So that's what I did. After reading the China study, I was disgusted with meat and dairy for about two years. You know, its theories were based on a 30 year study convincing us that meat and dairy may cause cancer and other diseases of Western affluence. Though this study shows this correlation, there has never been a tribe or culture in the history of the world that was vegan, and this is because this diet does not support health and reproduction in the long term. So big study or no, this theory of not eating animal protein does not resonate with me for this reason. Oh, you know, and the fact that I developed adrenal fatigue, thyroid problems, and numerous vitamin and mineral deficiencies on the diet, plus I was losing my mind. I was going into rages, and I was just 
had a, you know, a lot of negativity because if you don't eat animal protein, you don't um, uh, efficiently produce the feel-good neurotransmitters in your brain, like serotonin and dopamine. So I was like a mentally a wreck. Um, a friend of mine's hair began falling out when I know after a couple of years on the vegan diet. Another friend developed osteoporosis and broke her leg just by tripping and falling on the pavement. So these little problems, you know, they're left out of the book conveniently. You know, however, another person may fare better than I did and my friends on the vegan diet. There's some people that can do that and they seem to be okay, but I think that's very, very few people. After reading the paleo diet, I finally found my holy grail. All the health problems I developed on the vegan diet are slowly resolving on this diet. So the moral of the story is there's no cookie cutter diet for everyone. So avoid books telling you that this is the case. Some books are backed by solid science. Uh, most are not, even if they quote research studies left and right. So as we'll discuss in a minute, there's a lot of poorly done food research out there. Another reason nutrition is so confusing is because we get wrong advice from our doctors whom we love and trust. You know, many people trust their doctor and the medical establishment without question. But, you know, this can be a fatal mistake. And that's one of the my goals in Live to 110 is to show you that there's another way. Uh, there's more to healthcare than just the medical, mainstream medical establishment. Physicians are trained in diagnosing disease and prescribing medications. And this is a really valuable contribution to health when you're sick. But what about prevention or healing with food and nutrition? Some doctors have limited nutrition training as elective courses in medical school, but even fewer have postgraduate nutrition training. More than appalling, a full one quarter of medical schools do not even offer courses in nutrition. And it, it seems that since health is very much determined by your diet, that doctors should be required to learn about nutrition, don't you think? You know, there's a few gifted doctors who know what they're talking about when it comes to nutrition, but I've had so many of my clients with health problems or high cholesterol be told by their supposed top of the line cardiologist to eat margarine with trans fats. Um, you know, trans fats were proven since the year 2000 to contribute to heart disease and high cholesterol. So sadly, a doctor may have you know, learned a proven fact at a convention or training that he attended a decade ago and continues to dispense this outdated information. So my message is just question and research everything your doctor advises you to do. I do, and I almost always don't do what my doctor tells me to do because it just isn't right for me or their advice was flat out wrong. Another reason nutrition is so confusing, and this one trips up people a lot, is that there's a lot of wrong advice in the news. This is a CNN, newspapers, and magazines. You know, the media can provide us with, you know, very important information, yet much of the information on health and diet you're fed on CNN or other major news outlets and newspapers is usually wrong or false. And now you have to understand that headlines are meant to catch the consumer's attention and get ratings so they can get advertising money. They're not, the headlines aren't there necessarily to inform you. The media does not dare report unbiased information that would cast our advertisers who are, you know, usually food manufacturers or growers or pharmaceutical companies or their products in an unfavorable light. Therefore, a lot of what you hear in the news simply can't be relied upon. Frequently, news claims are made based on a single study or a brand new study, and you can't take a single study and report it as an absolute fact, but this is exactly what's happening when a new study is dispersed in the news. People take it as a fact and still have it in their heads as a fact a decade or more later. So keep in mind that research results must be proven over and over before they can be considered relevant uh, you know, and applicable to the population. So pause and think for a minute before believing everything you hear in the news, even if it's from a very credible news source like the New York Times or CNN. Media outlets are desperate for info and want to be the first to publish the latest research, whether the findings are valid or not. And headlines serve to sell newspapers, magazines, and advertising not to help your health. Another reason nutrition is so confusing is bad science. Um, Nutrition science is one of the only sciences in the world where two polar opposite theories can be totally proven, like that eating meat's healthy for you and then eating meat will kill you, um, which are both totally proven by science. 
So this can mainly be attributed to bad science and bad food scientists. You know, food science uh, does not have to be as rigorous as, say, nuclear physics. Um, but it's also due to the fact that people, including scientists who are human beings, are very loath to change their stance on existing paradigms, like, you know, the calories in, calories out theory of ther thermodynamics, where that you have to, you know, burn off all the calories that you eat in one day. You know, this has clearly been, de been debunked as too simplistic and outdated by many, uh, you know, many uh, important scientists who know what they're doing. And, you know, it's, it's all about how food, no matter how many calories in it, has a certain metabolic effect on our body. And that metabolic effect depends on whether that's going to cause us to gain weight or not. So more on that in another, another time. Another problem in nutrition science is the habit of measuring an individual ingredient's effects on health outcomes. For instance, the consumption of vitamin E on heart disease. The idea of nutritionism, um, it's an ideology built around the unexamined assumption that the key to understanding food is indeed the nutrient. And this approach of, involves breaking whole foods apart, you know, until a chicken breast, for instance, is nothing but an assemblage of different nutrients, vitamins, minerals, fats, and proteins. These individual components are studied for their effects on health. But this is not how food works in the body. Nutrients in food work in synergistic ways, you know, many nutrients of which we have not even discovered. So this thing called nutritionism all too often depends upon shoddy science, and Americans end up indulging in poor diets because of it. Another big reason nutrition is so confusing is because a lot of research is bought and paid for. This is a big problem in food research. The majority of research done by major universities is paid for by big biotechs uh, like Monsanto or food growers and manufacturers. Monsanto is a company that makes all the genetically modified seeds and pesticides to, uh, you know, to douse those seeds with pesticides. The, the genetically modified seeds are resistant to those pesticides. So not surprisingly, the research results are usually favorable to their funder. For many scientists and researchers, their work depends on pleasing granting agencies or state legislators, legislators responsible for funding. So it's difficult to decipher if what you're reading is real science conducted by unbiased scientists looking for honest answers. The food industry supports food science research if it will help them reap a greater profit, not in finding if a food is healthy for you. For instance, a ton of research has been conducted on showing that soy is very good for you. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, soy is unhealthy for you on so many levels. You know, for more information on this, see my blog post, The Little Known Dangers of Soy. And soy is one of the most profitable foods, generating billions for big agra or, you know, all the agricultural growers. This is why you hear so much positive news and research about soy. Um, sponsored studies have only one purpose, to establish a basis for marketing claims. They're not carried out to promote public health. Now, another problem in food research is just outright falsification of research. Um, it's rife today in science, adding to all the problems uh, you know, mentioned above. And there's really little or no consequences for scientists that falsify data. Only a retraction in small print years later in the scientific journal in which the study was originally published. But by then, it's common knowledge in society. You know, they don't go to bad scientist jail or anything like that. However, there's a lot to be gained by a scientist for data or result falsification. They're celebrated for new discoveries. They receive promotions and tenured college positions. They get continued or increased research funding, and they get increased pay or lucrative book deals. So a lot of upside to falsify them. So my advice, um, I say don't get worked up about any study you hear in the news. And know that many headlines are generated to produce ratings and sell magazines. So don't take health and, nu and nutrition advice from your doctor without doing a little research on your own, unless you truly believe they are versed in nutrition. You know, ask them about their education on nutrition. And, but no matter what they say, every person thinks they're an expert, especially physicians. Question it and research it to see if it will work for you. Don't take advice from the results of a new research study. Uh, wait until there's many, many studies proving the same thing. 
Because, you know, no matter how well developed and executed, study results can be wrong, inconclusive, and even falsified. As we see with so many things like women taking, um, uh, for instance, hor uh, hormone replacement therapy. For years and years and years, we were told it helps women ward off cancer. Um, but now we're finding it causes cancer. Uh, science is, you can, not always, but a lot of times is wrong many years later. So take everything with a healthy amount of skepticism. No matter what book you read, keep in mind that you have to eat the diet that works for you. Don't substitute, substitute anyone else's judgment for your own. It takes years of trial and error while listening to your body and its reactions to foods to figure out the best diet suited to you. You know, for instance, the amount of protein that you need. Then once you get it figured out, your needs change due to age and your health status. So it gets constantly fluctuating. So be prepared for that. This is a lifelong journey. So read books with an open beginner's mind and honor the fact that nutrition science will constantly change and enjoy the journey that is your path to health. For me, you know, after several failed diets, you know, I've settled on one conclusion that there are many ways to eat healthy, but you have to do the diet that is sustainable for you. You know, after finding out that I had health problems on the vegetarian and vegan diets, um, I urge anyone wishing to try a new diet to get medical and nutrient testing to gauge their health before starting a diet and revisiting the same testing six months into a diet. You want to test your hormones, vitamins, minerals, fats, cholesterol, blood sugar, inflammation markers, etc., etc. Metametrics.com has fantastic tests. You can request them from your doctor. And, and that's spelled M-E-T-A-M-E-T-R-I-X. However, I realize this is not feasible for everyone, um, but I recommend learning to listen to your body. If your body is craving a food, you know, not flour, sugar, we don't nutritionally need those, um, or you dream about a food not on your diet, this means that you might need that food nutritionally. You know, the body is a brilliant microcomputer that urges you to eat foods it needs nutritionally at any given moment. So if you, if you have food cravings for healthy foods that are not on your diet, if you have low energy, if you become depressed or unlike yourself mentally, if you develop a chronic illness or you just don't feel like you used to, do not ignore your body's cries for help. It's all too easy to attribute subtle changes in mood, energy levels, pain, or illness to other things besides your diet. But I assure you, it's most likely caused by your diet. Additionally, many fanatical about their diet get stuck on the idea of a diet or the ideology or lifestyle while their body is falling apart. This is very common with people doing the vegetarian and vegan diet. They just, their body is falling apart, but they just want to just stay put with their diet no matter what. And they just can't believe it's their healthy diet, their supposed healthy diet that's doing it. So I, I urge you to switch gears and listen to your body. The fact of the matter is that people who eat a diet that's right for them are generally mentally healthy, they have a healthy weight, they have radiant eyes and skin, are free of health problems, and they get straight A's on their medical tests. You know, they don't have nutrient deficiencies and whatnot. The proof is in the pudding. So next I want to talk about, you know, what is the best diet? This is uh, what all my clients ask me. They just want to know what is the best diet that I should eat? And this is a tough question um, because the best diet depends on you and your nutritional needs. Everyone's different based on their genetics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one thing's for sure, you, uh, you know, everyone can agree on the importance of a whole foods diet. Um, you, you need to eat um, whole foods closest to the form in which they were found in nature. You also want to eat a huge variety of foods. The bigger variety, the better. That's going to confer the most health benefits. And I like the paleo um, and my paleo-inspired Live to 110 diet. That gives you lots of details about every different aspect of your diet, healthy proteins, healthy fats, um, and all kinds of information about ingredients to avoid. The paleo diet is where, you know, you're definitely eating animal proteins, lots and lots of fresh vegetables, you know, nuts and seeds. Uh, paleos, you know, tend to not have dairy. I think dairy is a little bit okay for some people, not everyone. So the, the best diet really depends on you. Um, I think the vegetarian diet can work. 
Um, however, it's not going to work for most people, but the vegetarian diet can be, um, if you really, you have to know what you're doing though. You can't just stop eating meat and just eat French fries or something. Um, it can work if you know what you're doing. And you can, there are certain supplements you have to take for, to compensate for the deficiencies that people suffer as vegetarians, namely zinc and B12 and things of that nature. The vegan diet, um, I do not advise anyone to ever do this diet. It goes against human physiology and the body's nutritional needs. Um, I just think there are very, very rare individuals um, that can do this diet uh, successfully and still experience you know, vibrant health. Um, there's a difference between surviving and having optimal vibrant health. I think a lot of vegans are kind of barely surviving. Um, but for me, my goal with you is to tell you what you need to do to have optimal health. That's my goal. Um, so we'll start with some vegetables. Um, today we're going to talk about, you know, vegetables and water. That's going to be our focus of this webinar and trying to, you know, help you out with what to eat. Um, now, today we're going to go over a couple of important basics on nutrition. Most people do not eat enough vegetables or drink enough water. Um, the number one food missing from most people's diets is green vegetables. Uh, green vegetables are amazing because they have seven times the cancer-fighting power of other kinds of vegetables that are different colors. So be really vigilant about eating green vegetables every day. I want you to eat the largest variety of vegetables that you can. The constantly changing nutrient profiles of a wide variety of vegetables are going to confer the greatest health benefits to you. And vegetables in season, in season have almost twice the nutrient content of foods out of season. So attempt to learn when foods are in season and avoid vegetables shipped in from other countries when they're out of season in your area. And that's typically the case with fruits. Uh, people want their yummy fruits all year round, but you know, it's just not really... That, that all that great for you. Um, finding fruits and vegetables in season can best be accomplished by shopping at your local farmer's markets because they will usually not carry produce that's out of season. I also highly recommend to try to eat only organic vegetables so that you're not ingesting hundreds of pesticides, chemical fertilizers, chemical solvents, irradiated foods, which are kind of like microwaving the foods to kill bacteria, you're avoiding genetically modified organisms, which are absolutely shown to have disastrous health effects. And we're going to go into organic versus conventional food later in the program. Um, and if you want to know more about this issue, I urge you to see the movie geneticroulettemovie.com. And you can see the link down in the notes. However, conventional non-organic veggies are better than no veggies at all. So don't feel like you you know, you have to, you can only eat organic. Definitely eat conventional vegetables, one, if you can't afford them or if they're not available in your area. I, I avoid canned and frozen stuff. Just, just take a little bit of extra time and get fresh stuff and just cook it. It doesn't take that long. And next we're going to talk about water. Um, what type of water should you drink? I only drink spring water. Uh, spring water is the only type of water that you should drink. But it's okay if you drink other water occasionally, but try to make spring water the majority of the water you drink. Spring water has been filtered by the earth in ways that we don't completely understand. And the filtration methods work way better than any invented means of purifying water, like reverse osmosis or carbon filtration. Another advantage is that it contains a wide variety of trace minerals that the human body desperately needs. So many people are mineral deficient these days. And you can buy cheap, uh, really cheap, uh, safe spring water near you at findaspring.com. Um, you can also ask around locally if anyone knows where a spring is, um, if you're living in a small town or rural era, area. Um, you know, and for more information on this, it's a kind of a complex, confusing subject. Uh, you can read my blog, What Kind of Water Should I Drink? Um, the other type, and also you need to drink three liters of spring water a day. Well, that's a tall order, but you can do it. But that's what you, your body requires uh, to be healthy. The other drinks that are on the safe list are coconut water, but you don't want to overdo it too much because it does have sugar. I prefer raw coconut water out of real coconuts. Uh, there's also um, other brands you can buy of uh, raw coconut water that has not been pasteurized because, as you know, pasteurization kills all the yummy, healthy benefits of it, lots of vitamins. Um, I also am totally great with uh, vegetable juice, not fruit juice, vegetable juice, 
preferably green juice with some lemon in it to get rid of the bitterness or carrot juice. Um, carrot juice has the highest calcium content of really anything that you can eat. And I try to drink a little bit every day. Um, you want to avoid fruit juices um, because, like I said, they have too much sugar. Completely forget juice in a plastic bottle that you buy at the store. Uh, there is n these are nothing but sugar water with a few added synthetic vitamins. You know, fresh is best, but it still has a ton of sugar. And definitely you can drink some teas. Uh, teas are very healthy for you. They have lots of antioxidants and minerals. I prefer the herbal, but you can do some caffeinated here and there. Um, you can also drink fermented drinks like kombucha. Kombucha is a wonderful drink. You can also drink uh, kvass. So it's like a beet fermented drink. There's all kinds of interesting little options on the market these days. Um, sodas are totally out. Uh, sodas contain really nasty ingredients. Um, a short list is a high fructose corn syrup, aspartame, which kills brain cells and causes brain tumors, phosphoric acid, uh, caramel color, which is a possible carcinogen, artificial, artificial flavors, which are made from, from all kinds of really nasty ingredients. You'd die if you knew what some of these artificial flavors were made from. Um, for instance, like raspberry flavoring is made from the private parts of beavers. <laughs> it's a it's a flavoring that's squeezed out of a gland of a beaver. It's really disgusting. Um, sodas also contain sodium benzoate, which is a possible carcinogen. Brominated vegetable oil, which causes all kinds of health problems, which was recently removed from Gatorade because of public outcry. Sodas also contain calcium disodium EDTA, which is a preservative. It's a mineral leacher. Sodas contain high levels of acids like citric, tartaric, malic acid, all of which erode tooth enamel. And sodas actually leave you more nutrient depleted after you drink them. So got to cut those up. But the carbonation is okay. You can drink carbonated uh, mineral water. Carbonation is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, just it's also a good way to transition from eating sodas. Uh, if you drink a lot of sodas, you can switch to uh, carbonated flavored water just to help you on the transition to drinking more water. Um, coffee, that's a big debate. Um, coffee can be healthy if you drink one cup or less per day, but it does dehydrate you. You pee out all the liquid that you drink in the coffee plus a little bit more. So that's problematic. Plus, some of the problems in coffee is um, there's a lot of pesticides and mycotoxins in coffee. So I want you to drink organic coffee. However, you, there's still mycotoxins in organic coffees. Uh, there's some coffees you can find like a Bulletproof, Bulletproof Coffee um, from David Asprey. He sells it on his website. It's mycotoxin-free. He's a coffee freak. And so he's manufacturing his own coffee that's uh, a lot healthier than most. Uh, women who drink coffee have higher estrogen levels than those who don't. And this can lead to weight gain and other health problems, um, numerous health problems. Um, if you can learn more about that on my blog, Estrogen Dominant Syndrome. Plus, you know, the coffee really stresses your adrenals. All that caffeine makes your adrenals re release adrenaline. And when your adrenals, uh, adrenals get fatigued from all this stress, from the sugar and coffee and all of our, just our stressful, frenetic life, you, you produce fewer home hormones like uh, testosterone and progesterone and all the 50 or 60 different hormones that they produce. It's vital for body function. And when they get tired, your thyroid activity can also be reduced because they work as a team, your adrenals and thyroid. And this can cause you to gain weight. Um, so if you're drinking tons and tons and tons of coffee, um, that could be an indirect cause of weight gain. So it's best to just enjoy it occasionally. Now to wrap up, I, I want to talk about um, what do you want for your life? You know, how do you see yourself a, as you get older? Do you see yourself with grandkids or even great grandkids? Um, it is possible, but you have to begin thinking about your health now before you get sick or develop a chronic illness. Because by then, many times it's too late to turn your health around. It's never too late, but sometimes it is for many people. Statistically, the odds are not in your favor. Almost 50% of people develop cancer, and this does not even include all the chronic illnesses like autoimmune diseases, diabetes, etc. I mean, how many of you ha have the majority of your older family members on medication or managing a chronic illness? I know everyone in my family over 50 is sick to some degree and on multiple medications. 
So you don't want to wait until you're sick to start thinking about your health. Um, by then, it could be too late. The best time to work on your health is while you still have it. And that's the message I want to drive home to you. Don't, uh, don't wait until you get a health problem. That's not the time to do it. Um, interestingly, in China, you know, over the last, you know, hundreds of years, it's, it's interesting that doctors were paid not to treat illness. They were only paid if their p patients remained well. <laughs> and I think that's just a, such a wonderful business model that you only get paid as long as your patients stay well. So I think that's something uh, that's never going to happen in our, uh, in all, our culture, but it's definitely something to ponder. So the goals for the next session, um, I, I, well, actually, I want to begin by, for, by defining some goals for yourself. Um, I, I want to write down, I want you to write down three goals that you envision for your life. What do you want to accomplish in terms of your diet, your health, and your weight in the next three months? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And then I want you to write down some that you see in the next year. And while you're trying to accomplish these goals, keep in mind that change takes time. Think of one bad habit that you'd like to nix from your health routine. So what's the priority? Is it stopping smoking, cutting out sodas or candy? Is it starting an exercise regime? Start with working on one area at a time. For instance, uh, eliminate sodas and then try to eat more vegetables. And then maybe try to reduce or increase your protein according to your needs. It's going to take time, even years, to make incremental evolutionary changes. But I promise you will get better and better at healthy eating. You don't have to be perfect all the time. You know, I usually take Sunday off to pick out with my husband, who typically eats a, a horrible diet. Or, <coughs> or, you know, I just let myself have an unhealthy meal like once a week. But I invariably find myself at a restaurant that's not organic or only has, has unhealthy food. Now, so what? You know, you have to live your life. You can't be perfect all the time. I want you to think in terms of eating healthy 90, 95% of the time. And by doing this, you'll be doing a thousand percent better than the majority of the population. Believe me. So our goals for the next session, um, the health goals I'd like you to work on for our next session or for the next webinar that you watch are drinking three liters of water per day. And if you're, if you're over 200 pounds, you're, you're gonna need a little bit more. And so this is essential for health. Chronic dehydration has a profoundly negative impact on your health, leading to many, many diseases. And you're just not able to flush out acids and toxins and heavy metals without adequate water intake. So definitely start guzzling. It's better to drink your water at the beginning of the day not towards the end of the day because then you have to you might have to be waking up in the middle of the night to go to urinate. So when I wake up in the morning, I pound two or three glasses of water and I try to drink as much water as I can in between meals and of course water with meals. And usually try to get my fill, definitely um get my three liters in prior to two hours before bedtime. And then I just sip it as I need it to keep my throat wet. Um, but that's the best way to get it in. You don't want to be waiting until five o'clock and all of a sudden you're voraciously thirsty and then you start guzzling water. And then, you know, you're not going to, you're going to get up at the bathroom and, and urinate and that's going to deter you from drinking water because that's inconvenient. So front load in the beginning of the day. Next, I want to eat more green vegetables. Start with simply eating more green vegetables to crowd out unhealthy foods because if you're eating more green vegetables, you can't eat those foods. This is one of the most important changes that you can make for your health. But remember that vegetables have to be cooked in order to maximize mineral content uh, absorption. Um, if When you're eating raw vegetables, it's really, really difficult for us to digest. And so we don't end up getting all the health benefits of those foods. And um, I typically, I pretty much almost stopped eating salads, eating green salads, um, unless the they're cooked unless the, the green, leafy greens are cooked just because we just don't digest it. A lot of that goes through us without even being digested. It's more of a cleansing and salads are very cleansing. That's why they're good for weight loss. So I recommend eating cooked vegetables and you're going to get the most health benefits out of them. So that's all for today. You know, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming, um, but you know, we've got a lot of ground to cover. 
And I'm super excited to teach you about how to transform your health over the, this uh, six session webinar. Remember, little changes lead to big results. So here's living to 110.